What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from Zoom again. And this time we are here with Julian of the Almighty Gorod. It is great to be able to talk with you. Thanks for being here. Thanks a lot for inviting me here. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah. Anytime, man. Anytime. I'm stoked to see you guys on the North America tour with Cognitive. It's going to be an epic uh, time. And thanks for giving us some awesome new music. The Orb scheduled to come out very soon. Uh, for the first three singles that we heard so far, Victory, uh, Breeding Science, and the title track, is that a good representation of what all of the orb is going to sound like, or is there like more experimentation involved and a lot more new tricks and twists to discover? So it's representative in a way, because uh, the thing is that for this time, we took a bit uh, longer actually to compose the whole thing uh, compared to the previous album, Aethra, which was composed in a very short period of time. Now this one took a bit longer and we tried to explore new things and not being too much experimental but to give like a very proper identity to each song so it's representative in a way because all of these three songs are pretty different uh, but it doesn't mean that the other songs sound like the same like this one so i guess there's a bit more variety than before <laughs> so was the was there like a vision involved with the making of this? Was that sort of like a preconceived idea to make every song play by its own rules or did it just kind of turn out that way? Uh, actually, the, um, it's, the turnout, like it was made itself, uh, it, like, it became na natural because first of all, we were planning to do some because it was right after COVID, you know, and we didn't know what, exactly what to do when we would be, when we'd be able to play again. Because the thing is that with this band, our purpose is to play live. So this is our thing. And there was no show schedule, no tour, nothing like, nothing on the way. And so we we're just like, okay, let's do songs like one by one, like just singles and let's, let's see what happens. So there was not, we were not like into composing an entire new album like more releasing singles after singles and like de developing their own identity well, one song after one one by one but yeah then in the end uh when we started composing composing i always i actually started how would say intellectualizing things like to think to make something coherent between the titles first of all but i didn't know where we were heading to <laughs> when we started the composition i mean when victory was composed poof, there was no plan for the next thing so we just tried to we were putting step some things step by step mm -hmm. like uh, it was not developed as a proper concept album like we used to be before so it's kind of new because because yeah, the first thing was to make singles like independent singles but then we try to stick it together and make an album in the end so yeah this is why it's kind of this is a different way to do things like than than we are used to be Mm -hmm. So does this at all have any relationship to Aethera, your previous album? Is this sort of like a continuation of that, or does this signify like a new beginning for Gorod in a way? Uh, this is a continuation because, yeah, in, in Aethera, the way it was the topic, the, the overall topic is all about the moon and uh, spiritual identities. Like, uh, I'm going to saw the word tour following the difference, uh, let's say, the um, devotion following the moon like in the planet like in every kind of civilization it can be monotheistic it can be like um, pagan tribes and like you know there is spiritually that comes from japan south america and you know, middle asia uh, southern europe northern europe so there's a combination of many things but it's very let's say spiritual the way it's presented and uh, this new the orb it's all about the sun so there is a link in it because yeah the first is a concept about it no i throw was a concept about the moon and this one is about the sun but as the moon is more like dreamlike so it was it was fitting well with spirituality and the sun is more direct so it has to be a bit more straightforward and the topic is a actually way less dreamlike it's way more trivial than the new one and i uh, i really started a more philosophical approach than a spiritual one Mm -hmm. So the spirituality is not all about gods, goddesses, divinity, or d divine figures, or uh, devotions. This is more very uh, philo philosophical, and it's more a critic of this kind of the way to see spirituality. Is because yeah, the sun is is the uh, is the star that brings everything to light. That is the uh, bring us reality to us. Because when it's the day has come, we see things like they are, and when it's during the night, 
our senses are a little bit troubled because our eyes can see. So there is a way more imagination. When it's during the day, we have less imagination in a way. So this is why yeah, there is a link, but it's written a completely different way. <laughs> is this more or less like your own interpretation with the spiritual entity? Is this sort of your own spiritual experience? Or is like lyrically, this is very like analytical and almost kind of like documentarial in a way where there's like a lot of research that's involved with the making of this concept? Um, there is both of them. I mean, for Aethra, it was more about researchers because actually I am an art historian. I am a tour, a tour guide here, and I've been studying art history for a long time. So I am I my master degree. Of, yeah. <laughs> and you know, when I'm on tour, I'm always taking time, free time to visit museums and stuff because yeah, this is my job, like to welcome tourists in every place where there is heritage. So it can be museums, it can be monuments, it can be churches, anything, castles, whatever. And I've been studying a lot. My speciality is the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Though we call it the symbolistic time, the decadent time. So there is a lot of syncretism in religion and stuff because this is a time of trouble. This is after the first, the, I mean, the second real industrial revolution. And when there is modernity in a society, there is all, there are always a lot of people who try to think about the past and get into spiritual things. And the spirituality is super mixed in that period, so I like to make combination of it. But I mean, for Erythra, it's more, um, it's talking about a specific divinity on each song. Like it's a god from the moon from uh, Egypt for Bektinskos, for instance. Erythra is, for, uh, is about the um, Greek mythology and, uh, and so on. So, you know, so um, the inexorable is about the Shinto, uh, Kendra and the Maiden, it's uh, Hinduism. So there's, you know, this is very specific. On this one, there's also a bit of a spirituality, but um, this time I've been studying a bit more the writings of Aldous Huxley, the one who wrote The Brave New World. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a lot of uh, um, philosophical essay, essay, I don't know how you could call it in English, but this is sort of some uh, exercises that do themselves to, it's not a finished book. This is just thoughts were put into a book, and he's extremely clever, extremely intelligent. And when you read it, because in my, to me, like everyone talks about always George Orwell, Orwell, because 1984 is the thing, is the milestone of everything. But I, in my, I really prefer the point of view of Aldous Huxley, and they were some kind of rivals. And uh, let's say one is a bit more. Uh, philosophical and um, and uh, George Orwell is uh, George Orwell is very let's say pessimistic, <laughs> and uh, it's um, it really describes dark ages at the worst as it can go. And I'll certainly has a good further reflection to me. And so the, I mean this time, uh, this is the I, I think this is the uh, yeah the basic of all this album in the end, the reflection of all those like and my compared to mine or my own experience with that. Yeah. So this is a mixture because yeah, we have to be critical when you are want to be a philosopher or a thinker. <laughs> of course, of course. And you know, as somebody who studied art history myself, I have a bachelor's in fine arts. Like it feels great to be able to have this type of conversation with somebody who loves death metal and is also uh, an art historian in oh. a way. Do you feel like have you always needed to hear the music before you came up with this concept? Like when when we listened to a perfect absolution or a maze of recycled creeds or you know Aethra or the Orb, were you kind of like thinking of this concept before you wrote the lyrics and before any music was written, or did this idea sort of come through fruition when there was already music present? Um, the, the thing is that uh, when I'm with Gorod, I'm more I'm more known as a singer. <laughs> So, but first of all, uh, I'm a guitar player, and I'm first of all a composer. So um, I, I'm not, I would, say, I would say, a natural writer. I'm never writing lyrics like for my pleasure. What I'm doing naturally is composing music. I just love it. So I, I mean, in this way, I am unable to write any text w without music. It means I will never write lyrics like just, oh, there, there's some words that are coming to my mind. No, only, the first thing that always comes to my mind is music, is melodies. And the text is like mandatory <laughs> because we have to put a text. So um, the, um, for me, it's uh, the music is completely over. It's almost finished when I start to think about the concept and the lyrics. So the music is inspiring me. And for me, that's really important because um, w I think it's, it can be a loss of time when you think you have some ideas and you cannot make it fit to the music. 
So first of all, I, I'd rather be inspired by the music than write lyrics that can fit with it. I mean, it, uh, the emotion, like, uh, often with the for perfect like, solution, the eight title already existed. I mean, the eight songs, and I started to write the first songs when the eight tracks were already existing. Because as it was a concept, I had to think, okay, I want to write about this history, about this topic, and how can I divide this topic in eight part? So so that's this. This is how it, it was working because yeah, it, can, it can be divided in three, like in three big parts because there was actually three. So it has to be divided in eight. So I, I took a passage. Oh, this sounds, that sounds like there is a song that sounds really groovy and funky and funny and fresh. So it had to be about the Russian band because yeah, it has to be, it was a bit more sensual as the other one. There was one that is straightforward that is extremely brutal. So this one is about revenge. So about the passage that is talking about revenge, this was the passage of... I mean, yeah, the music is inspiring me. After all, that's uh, that's always the um, where it starts. You mm -hmm. well, well, being, <laughs> when you came into Gora, because I believe it was the Transcendence EP that was your first edition with the band. So when you joined up with Gora, were you looking at process of a new decline or leading vision and being like, okay, this is how the vocals are supposed to be approached, or with your art history background and your uh, and you know playing with multiple projects as well you were kind of allowed to bring a little bit of your own mix into Gorod. yeah that, that was the thing that that was a kind of tricky because yeah you know the guys of Gorod, we know we know each other with each other for really longer so uh, I, I think yeah, yeah we met together when i've been recording at their studio because matthew our main guitar player which is the mastermind is the one who's making the whole music you know, have always been like this with Gorod. Matthew is making the music and the singer is writing the lyrics. It, were, it has been always been working like this. And um, I knew them since the first album. So because we've been recording stuff with, uh, with them. And the previous singer, so um, uh, Guillaume, was really into sci-fi. And this is really not my thing. <laughs> I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm really an art historian. It has to be make a connection with history and stuff. But also the thing is that the first name of the band was Gorgasm. It was previously uh, named Gorgasm, but they signed a deal with Willow Tip, Willow Tip Records. And then, uh, because there was already a um, share event from Chicago, I guess, um, that was named Gorgasm, they had to change the name. And then it was Gora. So it's a Russian name. And, you know, um, my specialty is Central Europe. I'm specialized in Slavic cultures and everything. And I was like, oh, I can maybe find a way to make a connection between so the previous sci-fi topics and making some coherence with the name, band name, simple as that. So as it was a Russian name, I wanted to make a transition. Uh, I was talking to talk about history, but something that is makes sense with the band because Gora means just city in Russian. So it's uh, like a very important passage of the history of the Russian culture. In, from the 9th, 10th century and this is what is told there so for me that was a way to honor it because it was into sci-fi but it was developing concepts so i mean all the albums were a concept previously there is a big history in in this uh, in the whole thing so i had, i wanted to follow this but just to start to talk and talk about topics i enjoyed so i this is the way i find to uh, i find it out and in the end the newest album is a bit more connected with sci-fi well, not not truly it's more anticipation i would say just like asimov or this kind of um uh, ah, i forgot the, the name of this uh, novelist uh, it's not really my speciality but uh philip kadek also, this kind of writers, yeah, because I have a book here, so <laughs> my library is just behind me. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've always... But, I was... but yeah, Oxley for me is, is the, yeah, the, this is the link between the past and the future, <laughs> with the next and the all existence of Goran. Hmm. Well, to quote Henry Matisse, every painting is a self-portrait in a way, and I think the same could go with every song as well. So does your own personal life or your own personal emotions also play a role in how the music is formed and how you express vocally, even if you are using art historical references? Yes, yeah, so I'm trying to do it because yeah, I mean, it's uh, the music is composed by a musician and there is no specific emotion, emotion uh, led by any text or any thought. This is just music for music. So it's written this way, and in this music, what is writing, um, what Matthew is writing, I try to understand or what kind of feeling he wants you to express and to put some thing in it. So, I mean, this is uh, for me, this is not mandatory and like to put a specific emotion, but I have to feel it. So for sure, this is personal. 
mm -hmm. I cannot help myself. So that's always based on our own experience and stuff. And also, I mean, we were between two albums. We made a funny EP that was more into thrash stuff. And this is it was the first time we were talking about, like, I mean, our real life, our party we were having together, like something super trivial, super real, nothing dreamlike, nothing um, very complicated, so not, nothing sophisticated. And I started to think, oh, this is also cool because this is really honest in a way because this is exactly what we are. <laughs> so uh, was that kiss the freak uh, yeah. black kiss the freak yeah this kiss the freak is the perfect example of that but when i started to uh, i mean the first actually the very first lyrics i started to write for the next album is also shades which is something very special we see this is a, the slowest the darkest song but it was written during the lockdown so this is why this is something a bit different after the lockdown we made victory so this is the first single and this is why uh, we are finding back to life and i am um, actually this is the first time i composed a riff i mean the very first riff is something i've been writing and i gave it to macho and he made this so i mean the way i was writing it didn't sound the same but macho made something like himself and the lyrics i just wanted to sell everything that comes to my mind first without thinking all the sentences I've been writing are directly from me. Like, not not a specific inspiration, nothing. There is no purpose to sound like a writer, to follow any concept. It was completely spontaneous, like 100% spontaneous. Uh, I think I took, like, probably, I wrote the lyrics in 15 minutes, something like this. Wow. That's <laughs> well, the longest was the correction. I mean, the whole sentences was written in, like, 15 minutes. Like I say, I was like this, I was super angry. And, okay. Everything is there. So this is completely different than the other way. When I start to work this way, I will start to think, okay, let's keep it going this way so because it's changing and it's more honest. I mean, compared to what we are, and this is something we, as mentioned before, we started to experiment with Kiss the Freak in a funny way, but now it's not in a funny way, it's in a Gorod way for real as the as the band I was always trying to be. Well, <laughs> so do as well. <laughs> well, as somebody who studied art history, one thing I've noticed is whether it would be the Renaissance, Baroque, Neoclassicism, all the way to, you know, postmodernism and everything like that, mm -hmm. you know, there is always so much context behind every art, whether it would be Caravaggio or Jackson Pollock. And I always felt like sure. with the artists, the artists didn't want their work to be as open to interpretation. And I believe if they ever said that they were kind of lying in a way, because it, when you look at neoclassicism, it was always invoking a certain message or romanticism in a way. So do you want Gorod's music to be interpreted or the lyricism to serve as sort of like a manifesto as a way that describes a piece of art? Or is there room for Gorod's music to also be open to interpretation? The thing, yeah, it's as I've been... Yes, when you are studying art history, you are compared to study classicism of Renaissance. This is the whole thing. And this is like super intellectual art. So you always see like, this is the masterpiece. This is the way the art, like art should be. And also you want to get rid of this kind of rules. So I cannot help myself like to make like a real frame with topics, with things that, okay, you have to, there are references, there are quotes, there are things that cannot be misinterpreted <laughs> this is this meaning and uh, i mean um as a start, well, i always start to write that way like it's intellectualizing it's following a frame and then step by step i'm changing words i'm changing also names and when i'm talking about a specific god then i always at the first time i'm writing there's the name of the god but then i put it off and i put an expression change it then you can think oh then you have to make your own researches who i'm talking about <laughs> so who is that person or who is the character so this because it's one of his surname one of his uh, pseudonym or something like this and also then it oh it, it can op start to open to um, its own interpretation of anyone so yeah my purpose is like i give you a big frame and then you're free to go but there is still a frame <laughs> well when you play live also, when, uh, when you play live and you have to bring songs, you know, from all over the set list, whether it would be a perfect absolution or Aethra, Maze of Recycle Creeds or the mm -hmm. Orb, you know, you're going through multiple spaces and time periods and, you know, you're bringing in different eras into one experience. So when you play mm -hmm. these songs live and you're bringing in different eras from your life, does that almost bring another layer of meaning or another layer of context in a way? 
Yeah, sure. No, it's, it, there's always uh, the different dimensions because you have depends. It's, it's our seventh album. We have like more 60 songs or 70, I don't know, something like this. So sure, the the topics and are completely different also the way. But I mean, the music has always, there is a link, there is a red line between the first album and the last one, because yeah, this is still the same guy who is composing the thing. So even if there's like a big change, the roots, the real basic remains the same. So this is, this can be a trip because yeah, we have a lot of influences. We are attracted with different kinds of arts. You know, sure, classicism in the way to compose music, like following the right notes, the not too much dissonance, being fo following the real, the proper rules is, is uh, all what is going um, what uh, it, This is the basic of what the Gorod is made of that. But time to time, yeah, let's, um, let's authorize, let's allow the, ourselves to get rid of these rules and make some, and bring some more craziness in a way. But, I mean, yeah, this is in this band. These are more the characters that are actually crazy than the music. <laughs> the music is pretty, yeah, classy in a way. <laughs> well, do you feel like that? So the, we, we, oh, uh, I was just gonna ask. Do you feel like that the music can evolve over time as you evolve as an artist? Because I've always said that art history, you know, like for instance, one of my mm. favorite paintings, "The Death of Socrates" by Jacques Louis David. I mean. I feel like mm. the meaning of that painting has evolved so much in today's uh, climate that we live in. Or, you know, Edward Munch's work, the depression and the anxiety that he expresses in his work is so reminiscent to the way the world is now. For my rotting body, flowers mm. will grow, I am in them, and that is eternity. One of my favorite quotes ever. And um, yeah. so do you feel that, like, maybe as you evolve as an artist, the artwork or the art that you create in Gorod could also evolve over time? Or do you prefer if everything you create is more or less a snapshot of that particular time period you want to keep the orb in 2023 aether in 2018 etc no it's, it's yeah it has to evolve it has to because yeah in the end we no matter what we do we will always write the same story we cannot <laughs> because you are we are homo sapiens you we are human we are we are we are in our cage and if you when you try to get out of this cage yeah it it, it feels you have the illusion that it works but in the end you are still you think that you are you revolutions your own art, even like so, so many artists, like it's super hard to classify them, to rank them like in one kind or one genre, like yeah, artists for, for instance, when we talk about impressionism, like how many impressionists are actually impressionists? Probably one, Claude Monet. I agree. It. I agree 100 <laughs> percent that's it Cezanne is not he's a cubist as well like um it's, it's all, and yeah, Renoir is there is getting closer to cinema in the end like um Lautrec is clo closer to thought and this yeah so it's all of them to to go and we can call them impressionist but they are they have a impressionist is like yeah they had a little period that were doing that genre but all the rest of the works is completely different. So when you feel really feel like an evolution, it's kind of in, in the end always the same. So um, yeah, we are we want to change. Uh, I mean, when we start to make a new album, this is always the same. We want to do something different. <laughs> this is our purpose. When we, when we started, okay, let's do a new album, let's do new songs. It has to be different. We have to make an evolution. And then we start to play music and say, okay, let's do Okay, we make this experimentation, we listen to it and say, oh, that sucks. Because we are not good at it. <laughs> we are not used to it. So in the end, we get back to a work and let's say that uh, we, we are compelled to do what sounds good, what fits and what we are actually able to do. Like, uh, the, all the time, this is the thing like, okay, the vocal has to be different because this is the first start, so we clean vocals and stuff. And there are some passages like Macho is composing a riff, like that sounds completely fresh and something new. And I'm trying to make something that we never did before. We make, like, oh, yeah, that's cool. And then we re, re listen to it afterwards. And, oh, Right, that's cool, but mm, could be great. And then the third time, oh, that's horrible. Let's go back. Okay, that works. <laughs> so. We want to change, but 
you. Not that much, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to end this interview with talking some art history, and I, I'm so glad to hear you say that about the Impressionists, because like I've never like mm. when I go to the MoMA or the Met, you know, it's divided by different mm. periods of art. So I always see Seurat with mm. Monet. I get how maybe it's fair to say they've all been classified as impressionists because of Ernst Haeckel's light theory, right? Because his theory of light and how it impacts color, they kind of all interpreted yeah. that. So pretty much anybody who was looking at Ernst Haeckel's theory is pretty much classified as an impressionist, right? Absolutely, yeah. And so, yeah, we could be in classifying things like it's super easy, but yeah, this is just like, just talk about like a moment. This is a very short period in the end. And yeah. So it's the lights outside in the end. And there are so many artists like Degas, who is considered like one of the father of impressionists, is a workshop, it's a typical workshop artist. And Gorod is a workshop artist. We are not composing music like in the real, in the practice room or outside or jamming. It's not made like this. Like impressionism is based on reality. They look at the sun and look at, they take a picture and say, oh, this is the right moment of the light. This is very photographic in the end. And we are the opposite of that. <laughs> we are more in, in, a, in a classic way. So this is, even if you feel like you can classify it like this way because it sounds spontaneous, so it can be linked to that part of art, in the end, uh, it doesn't make really sense. So yeah, classification is always, um, <laughs> is always very, very tricky because when it comes to personality, when you mix the several personality, because just in one artist, there can be 10 different genres. So can you imagine in, with five different personalities crossing themselves and trying to make something that sticks together? Art history, <laughs> art, the art historical yeah. terms are almost a lot like the metal subgenres. And in fact, I use this analogy in art school, uh, classical mm -hmm. death metal. So cannibal corpse, morbid angel, deicide is Renaissance because they yeah. have their usual perspective and orthogonal lines and transverse lines that apply to all those songs. But then you, t I've Absolutely, always said, yeah. Melodic death metal is Baroque. I've always said that Slaughter of the Soul was the Caravaggio of melodic mm. death metal. The way that it moves is almost his use of tenebrism and the way that it brings its more um, recessive uh, elements mm. into it. And then I've always said that neoclassicism is tech death because it brings in all those different yeah. aspects into one. I don't know if you agree with that, but. Absolutely, yeah, this is something because we are always doing the same thing in a like, different genre for style with different uh, crafts or uh, abilities or a different kind of arts. It can be painting, it can be like uh, sculpture, it can be music. This is always the same, yeah. This is the way you built the thing, so sure. Classicism is the basic, like, the, and there is always three time, different times. So there is archaism. So when the first one was were experimenting new stuff, then there is the, uh, let's say, the golden age of it so we call the real classic thing when it's over top and then when it's too classic it's getting we are getting bored of it so baroque comes this is the degenerative art <laughs> so we're bringing a lot of influences and then too much chaos let's get back to the basic something one line one thing primitive and it's always the same yeah, cycle and, so i think we are we are exactly doing the same with music with subgenres yeah and you look at it in subgenres too, like cubism. There's analytical cubism, hermetic cubism, synthetic mm. cubism. But is Picasso, mm. like what you said about Monet being the only impressionist, I feel like Picasso is really the mm. only cubist, right? Yeah, he tried to make those experiments. I mean, for him, was to get back to the basic because when he started to make the, um, the, the Monet d'Avignon, which is in the MoMA, it was um, his revolution when he saw all the masks from this um, African heritage. So which was considered as something very primitive, but he saw that this is not primitive, this is primary. So this is our basic, this, we have to get back to this because we have been too far with intellectualized, intellectualized art because after neoclassicism and realism, art was too complicated. He wants to get back to the simple lines, to the three, real thing, to the real, real expression because there is something more magic that comes from simple things. So I guess Picasso had this kind of thing in, the, in his early works in the end because it's early and cubism started in that way. Get, the purpose was to get back to the primitive, I would say, Max Cavalera. <laughs> well, I just saw Soulfly the other day and that was a perfect analogy. And you it, it, you couldn't be more right because you look at the most modern work, like one of my favorite sculptors, Louis Nevelson. I mean, those relief sculptures yeah. go all the way back to ancient Egypt and the Roman times and how they utilize yeah. that medium. So I think in the end, all art history is really does trace back to the roots, bloody roots. Completely. <laughs> so it's always the same cycle that is repeating itself. And yeah. So yeah. before we. It makes 
So before we go, I want to thank you so much for an awesome conversation and for your time today. We definitely got to do a part two and just nerd out on art history. It'll probably be a three hour long podcast. But uh, whatever you want, yeah. I didn't want to start to talk about it because I can like start yeah. like days and night. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, well, when I come to the uh, show uh, that you guys are playing in Brooklyn, oh, we're gonna nerd out hard. Um, is there just okay. uh, is there just uh, anything else with Gora that you would like to promote off uh, with the release of the Orb? We got the North American tour with Cognitive coming up. Shout out to those guys as well. But uh, what else could we be expecting for Gora in the near future? So, um, so what, uh, as long as we know that the, the album will be officially released on the 7th of March and the 1st of March, we're going to put out, um, we're going to release a brand new track, like a really, really brand new, which would be you know, our single with, uh, with a real movie, wow. <laughs> a real movie clip, I would say. And this is something yeah, very unusual that we never made before. So this is the next surprise that will coming next, just before the official release. And we try to experiment new things, but don't worry. We made a lot of references for the two first album because, yeah, Leading Vision is pretty well represented on this one and also Process of a New Decline, which was the third album. So there are a combination of all that old works. And for the next songs, yeah, the orb, what the purpose was to show something, the newest thing. But then for the next one, you'll see that, yeah, expect that. We are. We still didn't abandon death metal. <laughs> no, no, no. Hell yeah. <laughs> like, well, thank you. Or take, take death or whatever. So I expect yeah. That, and the next set list will be yeah, pretty brutal and long and brutal and exhaustive. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, well, yeah. a lot, a lot of energy. So it means yeah, we started to get old, but the music lab is still still extreme as well so as 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 far as we are, we are still able to play to perform its life. Yeah, we go. We still go for it. So we don't. We didn't. We won't slow the tempo. We'll keep going like the old way. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah! Well, thank you so much, everybody. With, with new things. <laughs> awesome, everybody. We are here with the Almighty Gora, the Orb, March seventh. Pick that up. Be on the lookout for new stuff coming soon. We will see you next time on Heavy New York.